Hello, everyone, and welcome to English 1120 War in Literature. Uh, tonight, we're going to be uh, looking at, uh, well, our first of four lectures on Virgil's Aeneid. So uh, this text right here, Virgil's Aeneid. And um, I'll just note to start off with, I'm in a different location right now. So um, my Wi-Fi may be spotty. So if I do cut out, if I freeze, if you miss whole portions of the lecture, don't worry. As always, I'm recording. The recording will be fine and it'll be posted on, on the website and, and YouTube. So, so um, as I said, we're going to do one of the first of four lectures on the Aeneid. And I'm just out of curiosity, I'm wondering if uh, maybe a show of hands, who among us has before this class, let's say, heard of Virgil's Aeneid? Show of hands. I've heard of Virgil's Aeneid. So a couple people, a few in the comments section in the chat saying, uh, have, have heard of, of, of this. And now the next question, so, so a couple of saying they've heard of it, but uh, one saying uh, heard of Homer, but not, not the Aeneid. Has anyone read this? Has anyone been assigned portions of it to read in previous schooling? And that's a nope, nope. So this is a first. Uh, so if, uh, if, if you had come across Homer, there's, this is relatively new. So we'll go in with that assumption that this is brand new for everyone. What, what I'm showing, by the way, is a very, very nice edition of, of the Aeneid. What we have as that's been linked for you is the uh, A.S. Klein publicly available translation. So again, you haven't been required to purchase any text, but if you do want to purchase this text, this is the Robert Fagel's translation, which goes with, and, and you can get in a nice set with the Fagel's translation of the Iliad that we studied with, with the Odyssey for that matter, if you're so inclined. So tonight we're going to look at a bit of background in relation to, um, in relation to kind of who is Aeneas. So Aeneas is this figure that we hear about it a bit in the background of the Iliad. He's not a he's not the major character. Of course, Hector on the Trojan side is, but Aeneas is is one of their principal uh, fighters on the the Trojan side. And we'll talk a bit about what we hear about Aeneas in uh, in that epic. We'll talk about what what we know about Virgil and a bit start to uh, study a bit of the context of when Virgil was writing um, um, the Aeneid. And in the second lecture, we're gonna continue that. So the, the Wednesday lecture, the pre-recorded lecture, we'll continue that. We'll talk about the cultural background. So the Greek borrowing that um, the Aeneid is assuming that we know about. And it, we'll also talk about the historical background. So the historical background will be will be really important because I won't really want to stress how the Aeneid is pointing to in some ways the ongoing uh, wars that Rome had had with Carthage just prior to the writing of the Aeneid. So without further ado, I'm going to call up our, as always, the uh, PowerPoint presentation to so you can follow along with the points I'll be making. And in terms of uh, an outline of what we'll be doing in the lectures today, as I said, we'll be doing who is Aeneas, kind of an overview of the Aeneid and, and who is Aeneas, the importance of the Aeneid. We'll also go over some preliminaries with respect to Virgil. What could be, what could we think of as as more, uh, Virgil's moral intention. 
And some of the themes, maybe a recapping, well, let's say giving a preview of some of the themes of the epic. So in terms of, let's say an overview of the story, just so we know where we are, I'd, I'd like to start really quickly with just an overview of the story so everyone's on the same page. So in, in book one, in the opening of the epic, we have Aeneas, our, our titular character, who is this Trojan prince who, who has fled uh, the, the fallen uh, Troy, his fallen city. We see him and his men, various ships, landing on this shore in Northern Africa, just outside of Carthage. And they um, are finally accepted there by uh, the queen of Carthage, Dido. And he, at the, by the end of that book, he's about to begin recounting his tale at her request. Uh, where have you come from? What's going on? What's, what's been your story? So books two to three are him recounting the story of what happened. So books two, he recounts what had happened earlier, the fall of Troy. He recounts the famous um, Trojan horse. He recounts the, some of the, the horrible scenes that happened during the fall of Troy. And then in book three, he describes his various wanderings after the fall of Troy. So he wanders through different um, cities, uh, encounters uh, various uh, mythical creatures and, and adventures, much like Odysseus does in the Odyssey. So in a way, he follows the path of Odysseus in, in, as it's recounted in book three. In book four, Aeneas's recounting of the past ends, and we get to, let's say, the present of the narrative. And Aeneas and Dido have uh, a love affair, which in a way threatens the entire mission of Aeneas. Aeneas's mission, he, as he had recounted during, uh, during his recounting of his history, had been revealed to him to be the founding of the Trojan people in a new home, which would eventually become Rome. So if he were to stay there in Carthage, this would thwart that mission. He's prompted by, by Mercury. Uh, he's, uh, Mercury is sent down, a, a, a god in the, the Roman pantheon, uh, equivalent to Hermes, to remind him of his duty to continue on. He does. He says, okay, well, Dido, I'm going to have to go, basically. Dido takes this less than uh, stoically, and uh, she you know, curses him because, you know, they're, she's this jilted lover, right? And uh, curses him and then kills herself, okay? So it's a tra tragic tale of Dido there. And uh, again, uh, she's, she becomes in much later literature, this figure for um, kind of a, a site for seeing let's what we'll talk about as the cost of Rome, the cost of duty, and how Dido and what Dido represents often has to be sacrificed to fulfill those, those duties. And the tragedy of Dido is replayed in, in a lot of later literature. So in book five, there are fun funeral games in Sicily for Aeneas's dead father and Kaisis. In book six, it recounts uh, Aeneas's journey to the underworld he needs he's been told by the ghost of his father that he needs to descend to the underworld and be led there by this Sibyl in order to 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 gain information on the on the future of Rome and that will that will say give give drive and give give emphasis to his his mission he does so in book six he encounters Dido there, by the way, and she uh, does not speak a word to him and is, is still upset in the underworld. And then in book seven to 12, I have indicated there, we, if, if the first six books are in a way uh, Virgil's odyssey, it's, it's the journeys of Aeneas, 
the the last six books books seven to twelve are like the iliad it's he arrives on italy where he discovers that this is the place where he's he's to found the trojan people anew and he uh, origin uh uh originally latinus the the ruler of the, of the latin people there um welcomes him however amata his his queen his wife and uh does not um go along with this plan uh, latinus had promised aeneas that he could betroth lavinia his daughter and and that and take over kind of rule so to speak there uh amata does not agree with this and feels that Turnus, this other suitor of Lavinia, should be given the priority. Turnus, so she, uh, along with Turnus, conspires a, an alliance of, of Latins to fight this, these Trojans that have landed. So we have a, let's say, a parallel of the Iliad there. We have the Trojans now playing the role of the Greeks on a foreign soil with by their ships at beaches being swarmed by these allies and Turnus is, is kind of like a Hector and Aeneas is kind of like an Achilles. So in the first six books, Aeneas is, 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 an, is an Odysseus. In the last six books, in a way, he's a new Achilles. Um, so in book eight, uh, he, uh, he's given a new, he's given a new shield Again, like Achilles' shield, it's it's been forged by Vulcan, which is the Roman equivalent of Hephaestus. Hephaestus, and we'll look at that shield. So I won't go into that into much detail now. And then in the final books, there's uh, Pallas, this friend of Aeneas, is killed by Turnus, which parallels the death of Patroclus at the hands of Hector. This fires up Aeneas to a point of rage. And he eventually kills Turnus at the end, and the last lines are him killing Turnus. So we have this a lot of parallels, as I said, to to the actions of Achilles, and and it ends with this uh, death of Turnus. Okay, so someone in the chat saying they can't hear anymore, and and that's probably me, as I said, with my with my. Uh, my Wi-Fi and and I apologize for that. As I said, the 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 recording will be there. So I'm going to look at the timeline now, and and we. Uh, so I've highlighted where the Aeneid is here, in relation to the Iliad. So there's about 700 years that separate the writing of the Aeneid from when we are best. Our best guess in terms of when the Iliad was composed. Um, again, a point I, I tried to make earlier, but I'll, I'll try to make it a different way now. So the past is often this kind of flat canvas without perspective for us. So, so the ancients can seem like it's just, oh, this is all just ancient Greece and Rome. However, Virgil and Homer are not in, are not on the same temporal plane, so to speak. There's more time separating Virgil's Aeneid from Homer's Iliad than there is separating us from Shakespeare. So Shakespeare's writing is approximately 400 years ago. Again, around 700 years separating Virgil and Homer. So we, we have to think about that distance. We have to think about Virgil's writing as he himself thinking what he's really reaching into the past. He's reaching into ancient sources and really rewriting them. Um, the other thing I'll note here is that um, in terms of the bottom of this timeline, the context section, so obviously the Iliad referring to the Trojan War that may have taken place uh, 400 years earlier. The Aeneid in terms of the story is referring to the Trojan War as well, and the immediate after effects. And the story is taking place on this time frame of about uh, 1100 before the Common Era. However, because it's written 
uh, around 29 to 19 BCE, there's also topical or contemporary references to Roman history that happened much later. So uh, a couple of a couple of uh, ones I want to highlight here are the Th Third Punic War and the destruction of Carthage, so 146 BCE, and the Roman Civil War leading up to the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. Okay, so those are in the background as well. So when he talks about the horrors of Troy when it fell to the siege and what happened to the inhabitants of Troy and, and how we're to sympathize with the Trojans, I think we're also supposed to be sympathizing with the Carthaginians when they were destroyed by the Roman people, Virgil's own people in 146 BCE. And similarly, when we think about um, what Aeneas is doing with respect to winning a war on, on Italian soil and bringing order to, to um, Italy. I think there's supposed to be a parallel there to Augustus, who's the, the winner of this Battle of Actium, who, who brought finally peace to Rome after a century of, of civil war. <laughs> so, um, Homer's Iliad is a song of Troy, so it's about the Trojan War, as we all know. And um, as far as we know, he's not referring to any other historical events that happened between the fall of the, you know, between the Trojan War and, let's say, around the time he's writing. As far as we know, there's not a lot of topical references. Um, Whereas that's not the case for Virgil, as I just pointed out. So Virgil's Aeneid is a song of Aeneas, but it's also a song of Rome and its historical destiny. So the story refers to, to the journeys of Aeneas after the fall of Troy, but also looks forward prophetically to events of Roman history, the Punic Wars, civil wars, the rise of Caesar Augustus. So much like Homer was for the Greeks, Virgil's Aeneid quickly became seen as uh, far and above the, the greatest work of, of Roman literature. It became a, a national epic. It became the, the uh, kind of almost a, a pagan Bible for the Roman people, a style manual. Later in the Middle Ages was became the source of moral allegories and now and more recently in the modern era became uh, a document of, of European unity. So in different ways it's retained this this power to move the soul as few other works in the history of literature can. So I would say for myself, you know the Aeneid, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, I, I might have mentioned that before, but if you ever get a chance, uh, write, read Paradise Lost. And the Aeneid are up there uh, with, with probably the greatest uh, individual works uh, in, of, of literature. So who is Aeneas? So Aeneas is obviously the hero of, of the epic. And we learn about Aeneas in the Iliad book 20 where he's in the middle of a battle with the greatest hero of all, Achilles. So Achilles is, is um, this is in the peak of Achilles' um, Aristea. And Aeneas is on the verge of losing to, to Achilles when Poseidon intervenes to save him. So Pi Poseidon does so because Aeneas is known for his piety. And this will be an important theme in, in Virgil's epic and because he has a destiny to found another city and continue the, the Trojan royal line. So two important parts of Virgil's epic are this fact of Aeneas's piety and his destiny to found uh, uh, this continuation of the Trojan people. Aeneas's piety is encapsulated in Virgil's poem in the image we see of him uh, leaving the burning walls of Troy. So this is in 
Remember I mentioned Aeneas describes in book two what happened during the fall of Troy. Part of that description, he describes his own efforts to lead his family out of the burning uh, as, as Troy burns around him. He carries his father on his shoulder uh, who, who, who himself is carrying the household gods and he's leading his young son uh, uh, at, his, at his side or just behind him. Uh, and we see a sculpture there of, of, of that scene to the right. And here are the lines from, from book two, uh, line 896 to 906. With that, over my broad shoulders and round my neck, I spread a tawny lion skin for a cloak and bowing down, I lift my burden up. Little Eulis, clutching my right hand, Eulis is his son keeps pace with tripping steps. My wife trails on behind. And so we make our way along the pitch dark paths. And I who had never flinched at the hurtling spears or swarming Greek assaults, now every stir of wind, every whisper of sound alarms me, anxious both for the child beside me and burden on my back. So uh, a note about the importance of the Aeneid. Uh, again, I said, as I said, the parallel with Homer is, is a good one because the Virgil's poem, I think maybe only other than, only other than uh, Homer himself um, is, is uh, has had the greatest influence on, on the Western tradition afterwards okay so uh it be, provides a myth for the the uh R roman people about their foundation it becomes uh the myth that links roman history to the greek mythic tradition and uh because of its superb quality it quickly became as i said this educational centerpiece and became one of the basic pillars of Roman education along with the works of Terence, Cicero, and Sallust. And uh, just, just to give a, a brief indication, the, the impact of Virgil, like Homer on later literature is incalculable and, and later culture is incalculable, but just a couple of indications I'd say the, that we can point to is uh, it, it serves as a model for later literature, notably in Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, Dante uh, portrays Vir Virgil as, as his guide through hell and purgatory. We have an artistic representation by Delacroix at the, on the right there. Um, and uh, during uh, late antiquity and, and, and the Middle Ages, when, when Greek was not studied in, in Western Europe, so Aeneid was the primary source for the Trojan War myth. So the Trojan War myth was only, let's say, carried on in the West via the Aeneid. And still to this day, even with what we know of Greek literature, it's our, our major source for the Trojan uh, horse part of that story. Um, and yeah, and that's the point I'm making here. So it, it's our only surviving account of the Trojan horse and the sack of Troy. And in terms of what other takeaways we have in the epic, it's, it's, a, it's, it's more than a story of Aeneas's journey. I'd say it's, it's also an examination of, of leadership. So just as we will want to, <clears throat> just as we, we looked at Agamemnon for, let's say, the the shortcomings in Agamemnon's leadership, we'll see Aeneas as a model of leadership, okay? And uh, I think it also is provides important fodder, the epic does, for issues around empire and freedom, questions of the meaning of history, conflict, the, the conflict between duties and, and one's own desires, and the relationship of the individual to society. So a lot of these profound questions, enduring questions, the Aeneid has, let's say, profound uh, expression of, of the essential nature of those questions and some of the limits of, of each of these ideas, some of the limits of, of the questions themselves. 
So that's a bit about Aeneas. We've how we know Aeneas from the Iliad, a bit about, about the Aeneid as such. Now, Virgil. Virgil, uh, his, his dates there, 70 to 19 before the Common Era, uh, was uh, 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 living in, 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 the, uh, in Rome at this time, uh, was, uh, had written two major works before he started composing the Aeneid. The first, the Eclogues, is a collection of 10 bucolic poems. So they're pastoral poems, they're about you know, shepherds, they're in, in, a, in a setting outside of, of city and, 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 and let's say outside of kind of the cares of the city. They're out on a pastoral landscape and that separation allows them to provide, let's say a critique of, of the affairs of the political. And then the Georgics, which uh, were written after B Virgil began to associate with Augustus, so who became uh, emperor after the uh, Battle of Actium. And uh, the poem deals with agriculture and exalts the old fashioned virtues dear to Augustus. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. The, uh, the, the Wednesday lecture will talk about this, this, this ways of the ancestors that uh, Augustus was trying to bring back. So uh, interestingly, the Aeneid was incomplete when Virgil died in 19 BCE. And tradition tells us that Virgil asked uh, on his deathbed that the Aeneid, uh, that his manuscript for the Aeneid be burned, which would have been, when, when I think about what could have happened, like the chance circumstances that it survived, it's one of these, these great fortuitous events that it did survive. Uh, it, for all intents and purposes, this could have been destroyed. Uh, like so many ancient manuscripts we don't have. This could have been another one of these ancient manuscripts we don't ha didn't have. And uh, Augustus heard about this and forbade the burning of it. He had heard snippets of it already. He realized that this was a great national epic and, and much of it devoted to, to kind of a, uh, alluding to, to how Rome was destined to be great under his rule and, and, and saw it as obviously favorable uh, PR for himself, I, I, I imagine. Um, it wasn't completely, completely finished when he died. Um, however, I think the, uh, we could say that what remained to be finished are a few lines to be polished, a few lines that didn't have the complete, um, the complete meet, meter included yet, and maybe he was looking for the, the, the right ending for those lines. But it's not as though other books are missing and the whole structure of the story is, is, is piecemeal. So what do we know about Virgil's intention, the moral intention? So I, I'm put in brackets piety here. And I think there's a question in the chat there that I, that I missed, but I see some people jumped in about what is piety. So thank you and, and, and thanks for those responding. But, and we'll get to a definition of piety or Virgil's def definition of piety, but, uh, but basically let's think of it as dutiful, being dutiful uh, in relationship to all of one's duties, okay? So piety can sometimes have a sense of just being, performing, let's say religious duties. It's sometimes in, in our sense, our modern sense, it's sometimes, you know, someone's pious if they revere uh, God, whoever their, whoever their religious uh, religious uh, higher power, so to speak, is. Um, however, in Virgil's context, it had a broader meaning. Um, let us say, performing one's duties to all of those to whom one had a duty. So one has a duty as a father to the family. Okay, let us say, or as a mother to the family, one has a duty as a son or a daughter to the rest of the family. <clears throat> one has a duty as a, say, a public participant to, uh, to do uh, their civic duty, let us say, whether it's con their role in a club, their role in a, uh, their role as, as part of a defense force, their role as their, their, their job in an administrative role, what have you. One has a duty to the gods, 
uh, to perform sacrifice, to perform rituals. So if you're if you're a pious individual, one is a one uh, puts their duties to their family above their own interests. One puts their duties to the community above their own interests. One puts their duties to the the gods before their own interests. One always thinks about those duties and how they have to sacrifice their own sense of well-being for those duties. So um, I think, uh, you know, I guess maybe a, a virtue, uh, a virtue that uh, we could all use in the, in the modern world, uh, driven by, by uh, let's say, individual competition and, and greed, the modern liberal republic, so to speak. Um, so one question then is if if this what is Virgil's moral intention? Okay, so I'm saying that the, the I'll give as a short answer to that is I think instilling piety to some extent, but uh, but we'll go through what some of the ins and outs of this question are. So uh, one one assumption has been that that the poem is in in a way kind of a piece of Augustan propaganda that there is there's all these civil wars and that. Um, luckily, Aeneas comes along and provides order, just like Augustus provide order after our period of civil wars, okay? So there's, uh, there's that sense. Um, and as I mentioned here, Augustus brought peace to the Roman world, closing the gates of Janus, signifying, signifying bring, bringing of peace in 31 BCE for the first time after a century of civil war. <clears throat> and in the Wednesday lecture, we'll go over a bit of that, about, about that context of the civil wars. <clears throat> so Augustus, like Aeneas, brings peace after a lengthy and bloody struggle. However, more recently, some critics, so in the last, I would say, three decades, uh, have, have, seen a strain within the poem that criticizes the rule of Augustus. So maybe on the face of it, it looks like it, you know, Virgil's playing ball and, and, and saying what is politically convenient because Augustus is in power and Augustus wants a poem that's, that's obviously going to put him in a good light. And maybe on the surface, Virgil plays ball, but underneath maybe there for the subtle eye, for someone who, with a critical perspective, they can see a critique of that of of that rule. Um, so, so oh, what's in the chat here? Hiding criticisms in a nice story. Yes, of course, good one. Yes, that, thanks, Melody, for that. It's true. Yes, yeah, so hiding um, hiding truths in a in a in a sugary pill, so to speak. So here. In this th uh, thread of, of criticism, this thread of analysis, let's say, what seemed to be happening in the poem is an emphasis on the burden of Rome. And here, these, these let's say, critics, these more recent critics will highlight the Dido story I mentioned, you know, like maybe we're supposed to sympathize with Dido and maybe, you know, maybe Aeneas was cold to uh, have abandoned um, Dido. So, so they'll emphasize all these points where, let's say, the burden or molus of Rome is at play. So one is the treatment of Dido. Another episode is at the end of book six. Remember I mentioned that in book six, Aeneas descends into the underworld. And uh, as he's exiting the underworld, uh, he's given this vision, first of all, he's given this vision of the greatness of the line of Roman rulers that will descend from him leading up to Augustus, and, and how these are, you know, this is all going to be great. However, uh, as he's exiting, he's given this choice of, of well, it's not a choice, but he, he, we are told that he exits via the, the gates of ivory, and the gates of ivory indicate the the, the gate of false dreams as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to let's say true dreams. So one way of looking that at that is that this Roman future that he's just seen is a false dream. 
is let's say a lie that the Romans tell themselves that this was that this was good that what happened you know all the this Roman conquering and this con conquering of their enemies and this this powerful rule that they've developed. And then the other thing that is often pointed to is this treatment. Well, how how Achilles, sorry, Aeneas becomes Achilles, Achilles in, in his most rage driven. And, and the final scene we see is, is of him killing Turnus. Now remember Achilles in the in, in Homer killed kills Hector, of course. That's not the last, final word on Achilles. Achilles is great, not because he killed Hector, I, I would I would submit, but Achilles is is a great hero because of the profound insight he has towards the towards our condition as mortals, right? And his acceptance of mortality in Book Twenty Four, we don't see that in 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 the Aeneid for for Aeneas. So that would be a critical perspective on on. Let's say the the Augustan propaganda, so to speak. Uh, in my view, and you, you're invited to, to critically assess what you read and, and come up with your own view. You don't have to obviously parrot my view. I uh, just wanna put my cards on the table. Uh, what I think is that the moral center is this piety and that the Roman way of life, uh, the, the same type of life that Augustus was trying to revitalize in Rome, and I think it can be seen as a celebration of the rule of Augustus, maybe not Augustan propaganda, but I, I think a celebration of that rule after a hundred years of civil war. And, you know, civil war, you know, it's just one of the most horrible things, you know, it's, and they had lived through a hundred years of that. And any sign of, oh, okay, well, someone's bringing peace and order uh, is, is nothing to be scoffed at and nothing to, to be seen lightly. And I think, I think Virgil sees or did see a certain, let's say, uh, meaningful end to or, or purpose in the rule of Augustus and a purpose to the Roman mission that Augustus would be furthering. Um, I, think, uh, I think Virgil believed that they needed to recenter Roman life on their duty to the gods, duty to country, duty to family and friends, which had been kind of torn apart by the civil war. And, um, and in this system, you know, there, it, we see it in the Aeneid, uh, that system of duty puts tension between individual private experience and the duty that, they're, that they must perform in public. Uh, but that doesn't discredit the fact that that duty is there and, and is a noble ideal. Okay. <clears throat> so piety, so this dutifulness is presented in tension with, with madness or furor. Um, so in, in Latin, piety is pietas, okay? And it's, in, it's, it's uh, let's say, contrasted with furor. So furor is, is this kind of form of madness that can take a couple of forms. One is amor, passion, like love in the sense of a passion or desire. Um, and we see that in book four, uh, obviously the, He's, his, his pietas, his dutiful mission is challenged or threatened in book four by um, potentially being overcome by amor, like a, a madness in the form of an, a, a, a passionate or desiring attachment to, to Dido. And then the other form it can take is uh, ira or ira, which is kind of savage anger or rage. So remember the beginning of the 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 uh, the Iliad is is, is manus or uh, rage. So so to hear rage uh, in the form of ira takes a takes a big big uh, part of the story, and we see it. Let's say in let's say the second half of the Aeneid where, as I mentioned, after Pallas is killed by Turnus, 
Aeneas, like Achilles, becomes driven by this rage and anger in the form of uh, wanting to take revenge on Turnus. Also, much of the story is driven by Juno's implacable rage. So Juno is the equivalent of Hera. So is the Roman equivalent of Hera. Remember Hera was, was one of the, the jilted goddesses following the judgment of Paris, right? So Hera and, uh, and uh, Athena had never been kind toward the Trojans and, and, and Hera in particular, and in her Roman form, Juno, spends the whole epic trying to thwart Aeneas's mission. So another theme I want to underline here, so that, that's one theme is piety. Another theme would be the burden or hard labor, molus of Rome. So while the poem celebrates the achievement that, that is Rome, it also highlights the costs. So in terms of the sacrifice of our private attachments, that a hero such as Aeneas must undertake. Um, but also, so, so the, it, it, it highlights the sacrifices that Aeneas must make, but also it highlights the suffering of innocent bystanders, uh, those who get in the way of the destiny of Rome. So Dido didn't do, doesn't, you look back at it, and I don't know what she did to deserve her fate. Amata is the, uh, the mother of Lavinia, I mentioned the queen of the Latins who opposed uh, who opposed the uh, the the marriage of Aeneas to Lavinia, so she too suffers a Dido like fate. Turnus murdered at Aeneas's hands. Um, something we'll see too is, and it's related to the last theme about let's say the sacrifice. The burden and in terms of the burden of Rome in terms of the sacrifice Aeneas must make. So part of the sacrifice to committing one's public duty and being faced to those duties means he, he's almost cut off from, uh, from those around him. So the tension between his public duty and his private interests means he must keep up this public brave face while bottling up and not necessarily sharing with others his own anxieties. So we'll see this in his first two speeches in book one. When you read book one, pay close attention to, to um, the parts that are narrated and then you're gonna get speeches, okay? So the first speech of, of Aeneas, he expresses kind of some despair and then and then his second speech in front of, and that's to himself. And then to to his 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 comrades, there's it, he puts on a brave face, so to speak. And the narrator comes in um, afterwards and, and kind of undercuts that brave speech and said, basically saying the the narrator said, "Oh, this was a lot of va vaunting, despite the pain within his chest." So basically saying these are all brave words, but but in fact. Uh, Aeneas didn't uh, really think that they were so well off. The isolation, we also see this isolation in the sense that several times he tries to have human contact with his family and is foiled. So one is he asks to be able to embrace his mother, uh, Venus. So Venus is the Roman uh, equivalent of Aphrodite and it, and it is Aeneas's mother, okay? Um, now, Achilles has several touching scenes with Thetis. Thetis will embrace Achilles in the Iliad when Achilles is grieving after the death of Patroclus, or when he's grieving at the beginning because he lost his geras, his war prize, his uh, battle prize or, or, or war prize. So, um, so Thetis is always there kind of embracing and helping Aeneas, uh, Achilles, but Venus only shows up in disguise um, Aeneas has to kind of notice her when she's leaving, go, wait a minute, that's you, mom, what are you doing? You know, and, and, and he goes, where are you going? You know, why, why can't we just have a chat? And, uh, and she said, no, you know, I got to go. And then, <laughs> and then he's going, well, can you maybe a hug, mom? You know, I miss you. You know, I haven't seen you for where, forever. And then no, no deal, no dice, right? So, uh, so there's quite a contrast, let's say, between his relationship with his uh, his mother and Achilles, uh, but also 
Remember the other touching family scene from the Iliad is Hector's scene with Astyanax. So he's about to kiss his baby boy. And uh, Astyanax is this, uh, as a baby is afraid of this bright shiny helmet with the horsehair crest and shies away and cries. He takes off the helmet, Hector does, and kisses uh, Astyanax and they have a little giggle about it. Um, a very parallel scene uh, with Aeneas and um, Ascanius, or another, another name used for Aeneas' son is Eulus, so he's a, a couple of names there. But in a parallel scene, Aeneas tries to kiss Ascanius and he does so through his helmet. They're both wearing helmets and they just kind of, I don't know, butt heads or whatever you do if you're both wearing helmets. So there's always this physical separation or or uh, kind of symbolic separation between him and his, his loved ones. And maybe most touching of all, his first wife, Creusa, uh, dies in, in, in Troy as they're trying to escape. And uh, this is recounted in book two. And uh, he, he's recounting this as part of the story to Dido. These were her parting words and for all my tears, I long to say so much, dissolving into empty air, she left me now. Three times I tried to fling my arms around her neck. Three times I embraced nothing, her phantom sifting through my fingers, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. Sorry, the context I should have put there is in, in, in this, what he's recounting here is, is she had died. He realizes, he turns back that she's no longer there, that she's she's been lost in the kerfuffle of, of trying to escape Troy. He goes back into Troy to try to find her. All he, what he comes across is her ghost. And she says, no, I'm dead. You know, maybe if you had looked back a bit earlier. No, she didn't say that. But, um, but uh, she says, no, move, you know, take care of our son. Keep moving. I'm dead. Forget about me, me now. And as he indicates here, he says, you know, three times I tried to fling my arms around her neck. So the her is this, this ghost he's, he's uh, been discussing with. And three times I embraced nothing, her phantom sifting through my fingers. Light as a wind, quick as a dream. Um, and this, uh, something similar occurs when he tries to speak to Dido in the underworld to apologize, so to speak, you know, for his treatment of Dido. He, he she refuses to listen. And uh, she, she says no word. She just completely snub, snubs him, so to speak. Now, remember the words that Creusa spoke as a ghost. So remember we said, you know, three times I embraced her, her phantom sifting through my fingers, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. So in book six, he's in the underworld. He's speaking with his father Anchises. His father Anchises had died and he's in the underworld and, and he sees his father there. And he, so Aeneas pleaded, his face streaming with tears. Three times he tried to fling his arms around his neck. So three times again, he tries to hug, this time his father. Three times he embraced nothing, the phantom sifting through his fingers, light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. So very parallel, so parallel to the scene with Creusa, he's not able to embrace his wife, he's not able to embrace uh, Venus, his mother, he's not able to embrace his father in the underworld, he tries to kiss his son Ascanius, but is separated doing so by his helmet, I mentioned that already. So the structure, so that's a bit about the themes. So we talked about, so piety, uh, we talked about the burden of, of Rome, which included, let's say, the, the sacrifice Aeneas has to make, but also these innocent bystanders. And then another theme, the isolation of, of uh, Aeneas. Those are not the only themes we'll pick up on, but um, those are a few I wanted to, to set the stage at the outset. Um, because uh, the other themes obviously have to do with, um, let's say, let's say the the justice of Rome itself. What are we to make of the destiny of Rome? Is is this a just destiny in relation to to uh, the fictional representation of Troy, to their actual history with respect to Carthage? Um, 
so now the structure of the Aeneid. Uh, the first six books uh, have been referred to as the Odyssean part of the epic, and the final six as the Iliadic part. So the first half concentrates on his wanderings, and the second half on war. Um, most uh, modern readers, myself included, strongly prefer the first half of the Aeneid to the second. And, uh, and the funny thing is that the ancient critics had the exact opposite opinion. So uh, ancient cr critics felt that the first part was okay, it was good, it was really good, it was still best, you know, great, great literature, greater than anything that had been written. But the second part is when Virgil really picks it up because, well, there's a, there's a couple of things going on there. Um, first of all, um, it's now on home territory. It's on. Uh, it's in. You know, for for Virgil's audience, the original readers, the second half is referring to local towns, customs, and legends that provide. I guess you could call it an etiology. The uh, let's say background story, the background causes for the way they act, their their peoples, their names, and the story's more at home on a uh, on a metaphorical level as well. And in the second half, we see. Uh, people embroiled in bitter war and they had been at bitter war for, for a century. So we see uh, Romans fighting, I mean, well, they're not Romans yet, but we see uh, Italians fighting Italians and, and this is what they had been living. Uh, so in the, in the Aeneid, there's uh, an initial depiction of wanderings recalled in the past and of a love that is a distraction from virtue and piety. And then the truly, the truly epic depiction of wars and martial valor marked off. So there's a new invocation of the muse in book seven. So it, it's, so, it's so clearly delineated into two parts. You know how we've talked about Homer's epic and all epics starting with an epic invocation of the muse. Book seven starts with a new invocation. So it's, it's so nicely divided into two almost separate epics. Uh, I, I would say that with the other great epic, with uh, the, the great uh, kind of epic of the, the Christian era, the Milton's Paradise Lost, the, the reverse pattern holds. So there's an initial depiction of wars and rebellion and, and of fallen angels from books one to six. And then the quote unquote truly epic depiction of love conquering evil in the story of the fall and its overcoming through loving humility in the last books, books nine to 12. So whereas for Homer, I mean, whereas for Virgil, uh, love is a threat to the ultimate virtues that need to be cultivated uh, in, in Milton and, and the kind of the Christian epic, what becomes the salvation is love and, and it's what eventually overcomes these uh, the, the, the fallen nature of existence. So with that, I'll close. And as I mentioned in, in the next class, we're going to talk about the cultural background. And we're gonna talk about the historical background. So I've alluded a couple of times to the Punic Wars, the wars, so which were these wars with Carthage. And we'll look a bit more into that as well as these civil wars that were plaguing Rome. Any comments or questions before we close? Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great week. Have a great week, Professor. Have a great week, Professor Wilson. Have a great Take week. Take care.